are interviewing today former Congressman Jack Brooks in his home in Beaumont, Texas. Congressman Brooks went to the House in the 1950s, one of the youngest members of Congress. and uh, 52. 1952, and was a friend of President Johnson's all of the years he was in Washington and after he left Washington, very close to him. We're delighted that they're participating in this project. Congressman mm, Brooks. Glad to be here with you, Bob. Jim Watson, talk about Johnson. You know, Lyndon Johnson, most people think of him as a very activist, working guy, did a lot of things, big leader, all that business. But I think that his most significant thing, in my own relationship, he's a very thoughtful man, a very careful, a kind man, and a thoughtful man. Most people don't know that much about him. Uh, but uh, he was the kind of a president that if I told him that your wife was ill, he would thank me. You remember a Congress or a part and staff member or something, he just didn't know it. And he'd send them some flowers, he'd call them, he was concerned. He'd take the time to do that. And uh, not many people do that. Johnson did. At any time that I had an acquaintance, or we had a mutual acquaintance who had a problem, he wanted to know, and he tried to do something about it, which is pretty nice. Uh, when he thought, when he was first president, he thought the next year, he knew he wasn't that well, he knew he wouldn't be here that long, and he thought he ought to be nice to people that he wanted to be nice to. He wanted my son, Jeb Brooks, who was just a little baby, baby at that time, to... Um, come by and have his picture made with him. He wanted it done. He had seen him at my house earlier, came by to see him when he was just a, this big a baby, uh, but the picture wasn't any good and had a big mirror in the background. It didn't come out very well. And Johnson was careful about handling babies. And so when we got, and we had, which I, our time to be there was a fixed time, two o'clock, and I was concerned about that because I wanted it to be at 2 o'clock because little babies are scheduled to be happy and cheerful. Then after at 3 o'clock, he might be crying and difficult. And so we, um, uh, I was there on time and they, we got in on time. And Johnson was very gracious and kind and thoughtful, but he held that little boy about this high. He didn't give him a hug because Johnson had a cold. And he didn't want to give that baby the cold, didn't want to run the risk. Now that's a pretty thoughtful guy. I never forget um, when he was not president at the ranch, dying really, uh, he wanted us to come out there and bring Jeb and Kate. We didn't have Kimberly, our third child then. Uh, this was after he was president, a few couple of years or so after that. And so he, we came out to the ranch. He ordered up a helicopter for, uh, and I think Bird took him on that tour, actually, see the exotic animals and look at the ranch. Sharon, uh, my assistant, went with us then, and he took Sharon and the children, Charlotte, and they went looking around and had a good time. Uh, and I sat and visited with, with, uh, with Lyndon Johnson. And we had a good visit, as we always did. We had a lot to talk about. And uh, he had, uh, had the Texas University football team there, most of them there for lunch to entertain Jeb. Johnson thought a lot about other people. Nobody, not many people think that. You don't hear him writing much about that. But Johnson was a good, thoughtful man. And when did you first meet him? Uh, I first met uh, Lyndon Johnson when I was in the state legislature. I went to the legislature when I was 23. And I was there in the legislature, and he was, that was in 1946. And in the next year or two, Johnson was in there visiting, coming into Austin, came down the legislature. And I met him just briefly. 
and um, was impressed with him. Of course, he was tall and personable. We didn't have any big, long conversation or anything. And uh, then I met him again, of course, when I went to Congress in January of 53. And Johnson was a, a major help to me. Uh, Sam Rabin was really my mentor. I had a drink with Mr. Rabin most every night. He told me that. He said, the first day I was sworn in, Johnson, I mean, uh, uh, Speaker Rabin said, uh, son, I want you to come have a drink with me tonight and every night as long as we're both here. And on many of the, and I did, and on many of those occasions, uh, Johnson would come over. I can hear him now. Rabin, pick up the phone. Yep. Yep. We're still here. Yep. Yep. We'll see. We'll be here. Thank you. Johnson, coming over. It would be 7 o'clock at night, you know. We'd already been there for an hour and a half. But Johnson had come late. And his, one of his main ploys in coming over was to get Rayburn and the House to move on, to hold some real sticky bill. Keep it in the House as long as possible so that Johnson could orchestrate the handling of it when this hot potato got to the Senate, he'd know what the subcommittee vote was, the committee vote, and the Senate vote. And he'd know just how you're going to handle it, just like a, a wizard. He would run it right through, just handle it beautifully. Where it would take us months and months to fathom out. And I would, on the other hand, tell Rayburn, we ought to vote on it tomorrow. I'm ready to vote. This is just a pain to us. Let's get it over with. Don't hold it. Let's vote on it now. Why delay? Johnson didn't like that. He wanted to move slowly so he'd have time to get everything set. He was a rascal. And another thing the rascal would do, if you had a picture made, and I have one made with uh, a good picture, made it in, uh, during the campaign of uh, 1960 with uh, Jack Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson and me. I was in the middle and got one on each side. Well, you know, I'm not very tall. Kennedy is a little bit taller than I am, so Kennedy sat stand by me like this. Johnson, the rascal, who is already taller than both of us, would sit back, stand back about this far. And every photographer in the world knows that that makes the image that much higher. And after it's over with, I uh, admonished Johnson for that ploy. He just laughed. He did it all the time. If you look at the pictures, you'll see that if he has somebody that's four feet high, he'll stand behind them like this so he looks like he's six feet taller than them instead of just four feet taller. Oh, he was a rascal. How about things like that? Now, I would say something else about him. Um, in 1937, when he and Albert Thomas were elected to Congress, I was a, a junior in high school, senior, I mean a freshman in high school. Worked that summer for 10 cents an hour. It was a wonderful time of life. But I needed that money. And uh, they had a difference about who was going to be on the Appropriations Committee. And uh, Albert Thomas won. It was a tough fight. Uh, Johnson suspected Albert of getting some member of the committee that was making that decision out of the hospital and getting a proxy from a man that was almost dead of everything. And... Uh, uh, Thomas said that Johnson was demanding and didn't have the experience to do it and shouldn't have had it anyhow. Anyhow, they were not, though nobody realized that, the best of friends for many years. When I came to Congress in 53, they were still enemies. They both had allegiances to some of the same people in Houston, George Brown and others. And they were all friends. And they built the NASA space station. 
transportation. Johnson put the clout on the Senate for the money. Johnson and Thomas handled the money in the, in the House. And George Brown selected the site in Houston. And it all worked out fine, but I knew that they were not happy because when I would visit with Johnson, he'd say, and I visited with Thomas. We, Thomas was my bosom friend. I loved him. And uh, Thomas would say, you know, I see you down there with uh, Johnson all the time. He says, you better watch him. I'll tell you, really, now, Jack. And Johnson would say, now, you know, you better keep an eye on old Albert. Uh, you know why those Secret Service men were on the, on the running board when Roosevelt went to Houston and Thomas was there. They didn't want Thomas to steal his watch. They were not, <laughs> they, kept, they kept working on me. They, weren't, they, didn't, they didn't want me to get carried away with the evil of the others, which I thought was kind of funny. And so, one day, Charlotte and I decided when he had bought a Pearl Mester's house out there in Washington, a nice place to entertain. And I said, Charlotte said, we ought to get them together. She knew about this. I had told her. And so we invited them both, tried to get them both to get, talk to Thomas Johnson. If we could not have Albert and Lyra out, we'd all have dinner together. And Johnson was willing. And we set a time and an evening, and we went out there, the six of us, and they were gracious. We had a drink, and got to visiting a little, breaking the ice a little, and then we had another drink. And Thomas started talking about one of the things he had done to Johnson, and then Johnson started talking about one of the things he'd done to Thomas. And I tell you, it got we had more and more drinks, and more and more incidents came up. And Johnson reminded me that while we had had a little falling out about a federal judge, he said, "When I was, even I didn't have to pick federal judges when I was a congressman, Jack. You shouldn't have had anything." To do. <laughs> and Thomas, Thomas just watched that argument we'd had about some land in Houston that he got mad at me about. Uh, he wanted it given back to the people that donated it to Rice. He wanted it given back to him or something. The federal government had it. They'd given it to the government. And he wanted the government to give it back to him. Not, I wanted the government to sell it to the high bidder worth a lot of money. But anyhow, they got, we didn't eat until pretty late. Ate pretty late. And uh, had several drinks. And... Uh, Charlotte uh, drove me home, and Lyra got Albert home, and, and Johnson just made it upstairs to bed. But after that, Johnson and Thomas were friends. And uh, they loved each other, and they got along fine. And I thought that was well worth doing. It wasn't good for... Uh, adverse legislators because between Johnson with me working on it and fingering them good and Thomas working on their appropriations and, and Johnson not being supportive, some of them got into real trouble because that combination was powerful, the Johnson and Thomas operation. I thought it was fun. Just you, loved it. You were you were in Congress and, and had developed uh, a good deal of seniority by the time uh, LBJ became president. And uh, when all the great society... Yeah, 15 years. When all the great society uh, legislation came That's through, correct. The 89th Congress, in my opinion, is, was one of the great Congresses in the history of the country. With well... All, with all that great society legislation. Oh, sure. You want to talk about that? Well, I was for it all. That suited me fine, and I helped on it. And when you went down to visit with Johnson, as we, Charlotte and I did often to have dinner with him quietly, um, he'd talk about a lot of things. And, and he had a lot of assignments for other people. He'd have 
uh, when you worked for him, he'd tell you about this and this he wanted done this week and this and this. He always had a whole hat full of problems that he wanted you to work on. And I did. And uh, we were very, it was very successful. Uh, civil rights, for example, Johnson was for it. Uh, Kennedy had been for it. We were going to do it. I was working on the legislation with uh, Emanuel Sulla, who was chairman of Judiciary Com a Committee from uh, New York, a very wonderful, erudite scholar, a, a lovable man. He was, I had been on his committee, was the first one I, well, I went on that one second. He was wonderful to me. And uh, I helped Manny on that, worked on it with him pretty steady. I was on his subcommittee, which helps. That's the right one to be on if you're on a subcommittee. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, so we got that passed. And Johnson was good about it. Always very supportive. I heard some people say Tip O'Neill had something to do with it. I didn't know what. The committee was made up of a lot of Southerners. And they were difficult. And on the night, on the morning, we were going to have the markup on the Civil Rights Bill. Um, two of Kennedy's stalwarts from the Justice Department one of them called me and said, I hope you can come down and see the chairman now. He's concerned about this bill. Chairman Mandy saw. It. So I went down the committee and there they were with Seller. Seller looked like he was a little perturbed. And I said, Manny, I said, you came to Congress the year I was born. You've been here for 40 years. What do you care what those dissident members say or think about you or anything else? Nothing. We'll go in there, gavel that thing through, and recognize the people we need to make appropriate motions. Don't recognize them. Gavel it through. Take the vote, and it'll pass. Going away. Don't worry about it. That's all there is to it. He said, pull the drawer open. Old school. Pulled the drawer open of his desk, pulled out a bottle of whiskey, said, let's have a drink on it, Jack. So he had a little drink, had to me, I had a little drink. The two honchos from the Justice Department, the big shots, he didn't offer them a drink, say another damn word to them, put the top on the bottle, put it back in his drawer, closed it, and got up and went in and had the meeting. I liked that. I thought it worked out beautifully. <laughs> Anyhow, Johnson's programs had a way of getting done because what people don't understand is that Johnson was a, a connoisseur at Congress. He served in the House. He served in the Senate. He worked on subcommittees, worked on committees. He worked in management, scheduling, conference committees. He knew the intricate details of how a bill goes. And he also knew, superimposed on all of this knowledge of the mechanics of the operation, which are fairly detailed and sometimes can be a little tricky. He understood people. He understood what motivated members of Congress and the Senate. And he knew how to persuade them. And he was not adverse to picking up the phone and talking to them or going to see them. Talking to him with their lapel, ruin the damn lapel. He liked to jerk on people's lapel. And uh, he was fun. He was fun. I'll tell you another thing. One time we were having dinner in the White, White House. Well, before that, I had a bill to, to have uh, uh, independent auditors, internal auditors, for each agency in the government, not to restrict the management, but to, as a management tool, they would report to the secretary of whatever the agency was. And if in about, I think it was four months, five months, three months, if they had not taken any action at all, 
then they would send the report to me, my, sub, my committee, government operations at the time. And that, then I would have taken it and moved it from there and done fine. I would have got them a little publicity and a little adverse comment and a little investigation. And we'd have seen what they would do to save that money or more efficiently operate their agency. I didn't have any awe of how they ran them, you understand. And so a couple of the agencies weren't for it, as you can understand. Some of them, are pretty, they don't want anybody to know that they're not inefficient, they're efficient or that they're wasting money. So they were not supportive of the legislation. And Johnson asked me one time how it was going. I told him we had some problems with some of the agencies. Well, he said, who? And I told him. And he called them. And they wrote letters and said that we have thought this over and really believe that it would be uh, useful. You could see their arms had been twisted and their hands were hurting, but they signed those letters. And we passed it in the committee and in the House. Went to the Senate. And some of those same dissidents got some senator to hold it. And I was having dinner at the White House that night, just Johnson and Linda Bird and, and Charlotte and I. And I said, well, we're still having trouble with that old boy. He said, yes, I know. And the phone rang, and he'd already got his staff. They'd been tracking that senator down. And that senator was at an airport. Johnson took the phone off from the table, got it from the table and walked the phone over here. Talking to him on the phone, he talked to him about, he had some projects in his state that were very important to him. And he, Johnson says he'd been looking at them and he was looking at them pretty hard, but he was concerned about this legislation that uh, Jack Brooks had sent over on uh, internal auditors for the various agencies. And he thought it was worthwhile and useful and he hoped that the senator could see it that way and take his hold off that legislation. And the senator, after that discussion of those projects in his state, decided that he could that minute take the hold off. And the bill passed and it was signed. Now that's Johnson helping and he knows how to help. Now there are not many people that I knew as president and I knew all the presidents since uh, Truman, that were that good at picking up a phone and talking to people and, and uh, persuading them and getting action. Johnson was a wonderful guy, a wonderful friend. I enjoyed that. That was fun. Let me see what else. Uh, first time I'm... Well, we might talk about one other thing. Uh, we, um, I was in the motorcade in Dallas on the 22nd, uh, interesting day, anniversary date. 40 years ago today. That's correct. And I heard those shots. I knew there were shots. I'd been shot at before. I wasn't being shot at this time, thank goodness. And uh, the car speeded up. Then we went to the hospital. I got out. And uh, Larry O'Brien was just in shock, staggering along, and the policeman wasn't going to let him in. Dallas policemen are that way. And I told him he was the aide to President Kennedy and that he should be admitted to the hospital. And uh, we went on in, and the Secret Service pulled me off to where Johnson was. They had Johnson behind a, in a little cart around a corner uh, with Bird and with... Uh, Homer Thornberry, who had gotten there. And he liked Homer Thornberry, congressman from Austin, as you know. And uh, we stayed there for a while, and uh, Johnson said, Jack, I want you to take Bird to go and see Jackie and Nellie. Would you do that? So I did. We went to see Jackie. Jack was lying out there in, in the room there with a sheet over his head, dead as a post. And Jackie was a little disheveled, and Bird saw him. Then we went upstairs to where they had Nellie. I told Nellie, quit crying. I didn't think that Conley was hurt badly. He was going to be fine. And I gave her my handkerchief. She wiped her little eyes, quit crying. 
and then we left there. And um, we got back, and the Secret Service, I wanted, there was some pressure for Johnson to say he was president, and Johnson said he wasn't about to do anything till we had the coroner's report. Johnson was not running toward being president when the president had not been declared dead by a coroner, other than by everybody that saw him, but that's not the official declaration. And so he waited until that was done. When that was done, the Secret Service wanted him out of there because they didn't know how many shooters there were in the area. And so he said, we'll take two cars. They said, they take two cars and I'll go in one, Jack, you go with Bird in the other, and Homo will go with me. So that's the way we left. And we went to the airport. And we got to the airport, got on the plane, fishing around a little bit, talking to Johnson. I, my suggestion was, we get sworn in now, right there, because he said, well, why? I said, well, but two reasons. One, the country should not be in trauma and, and anguishing over no president for a period of time. Internationally, it's not wise to have no a head of a nation for any period of time. And I said, besides that, <coughs> while I get along with him fine, and we've had a good relationship, Bobby Kennedy hates your guts and you're not too fond of him, and he will screw up this ceremony some way, just as sure as we're sitting here. And it'd be a lot better to call Sarah Hughes and get Sarah out here. You made her a federal judge, and she'd be delighted to come out here and swear you in. Well, they did that. And uh, Sarah came, it's fine. Incidentally, I don't think they ever found the Bible. I don't know who got the Bible. It wasn't me. The Bible that they swore him in on. Amen. And uh, Albert Thomas was in that picture. And Jack Valenti, Holman, Secret Service people. Jackie, Bird, and Johnson. And a couple of other people, and that was about it. Pretty crowded in that airport, in the cockpit, in the uh, some part of that airplane. And, uh, and that was over with, and we went to Washington, and I called Charlotte. Charlotte was supposed to meet me in Austin. We were going to Austin, or Houston, I think it was, for Austin for a big ceremony. And I told her I was going to Washington and to meet me there when she could. Bless her heart, I loved her, I was fine. Somebody complained about that one time, about my calling from the plane. I never replied. And so we went to Washington and finally got off and got all that done. And, and uh, Johnson and I had, I think we had dinner that night. And uh, the next night we visited with him. Um, he was just getting set up. He called me and wanted to come have dinner with him. With him, he used to send a car to pick us up. Uh, I said, how about Charlotte? Well, oh yeah, he wanted Charlotte, especially Charlotte. He loved Charlotte. He would, you know. Uh, so it worked out all right, and we had a good relationship just from where it go on that presidency business. And I was for Hubert Humphrey. I argued strong for Hubert Humphrey to be a vice president when he was running. And Hubert was a good vice president. I think it was a tragedy that he didn't get elected. It wasn't Johnson's fault. I mean, it just the nuances of politics are, are very funny. I always said that anybody can get beat. I didn't think it was going to be me, but I was in 94. Uh, Democrats kind of sat on their hands and Republicans coalesced and they work hard. Republicans work hard for their candidates. 
and they'll vote for any Republican. Any Republican, I tell you what, you the devil himself said he was a Republican. They'd vote for him quick and support him, give him a lot of money. But, uh, and that happened in 94. We had lost a lot of good Democrats. Although it was a blessing for me, my wife was ecstatic, tickled to death. And when I had Kimberly on my arm, or then she was about 17, 18 year old, pretty little girl like that, telling television here at home at the end of the election. I said, well, the people have spoken. It's been a challenging life and I've appreciated it. And you've spoken and I know that you'll get everything you so richly deserve. My opponent that they had elected and they did get it, nothing for two years. And of course, I didn't like getting beat. I didn't mind leaving Congress. I was ready to leave Congress. I'd had enough of that. And so I didn't quit campaigning. And for the next two years, I continued my efforts to see that we had a decent congressman down here. And at the end of two years, one of my former interns was elected and is still being elected as congressman. We beat that character thoroughly. He hadn't been elected to anything since, statewide or otherwise. And his last job he got fired from over in Galveston County. But his wife worked for NASA, and I never did get her fired. I thought that would be petty. You know, I'd have fired him in a minute, but I thought it would be petty to take advantage of his wife. And I just didn't do that. I thought that'd be a little much. Some people say that's not like me, but I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. He was, a, he was a very funny man and a great storyteller. Do you have any? Uh, Johnson? Any memories of... Uh... <clears throat> well, Judge Kreitz was the double six in dominoes. If you were playing dominoes and you had Judge Kreitz, that means you had the double six. <laughs> he, um, he played with... Uh, who did I play with? Johnson and Mahon, and it might have been Sam. Sam Johnson, his brother, played with us. And we were beaten. He was beating Mahon pretty good. Talking about Judge Kreitz and a few other little things he did. Somebody told him he was making a mistake beating Mahon, but didn't worry him. It did worry him though, and I played him dominoes out at the hospital when he had his operation, and I beat him. That irritated him. That was good for him, keep his blood pressure up. And I'm the one that tell him no sometime. One time he had a bill to do something, I forget what it was, and I told him that's a foolish idea, it's not gonna pass. I'm not for it, I don't think it'll work. We're not gonna do that in Congress. I don't believe. Yes, we are. You just don't want to help, you know, and he just raised all kind of hell with you. Like you just shot him or something. You just don't want to be for the program, Brooks. You're just not helping. Well, I said it's not going to pass. And it didn't. And he never mentioned it again. Some of the ends kind of thought that Brooks would get checked out by not always agreeing. But I never did, because Johnson knew I told him the truth, what I thought was the truth. And it often turned out to be the case. So, uh, yeah, we did all right on that. I'll, I'll tell you one thing. It's back on his being thoughtful. We were sitting in the, you know, the little gallery on the second floor, the little gallery at the White House. We were back there having a drink after supper one night talking about just various things, appointments. He had lots of appointments to make. I had told him one time, you ought to let Yarbrough have an appointment every now and then. I said, you got more than you got time to make. We hunt for good people. And let old Yarbrough have some of them. It'd make him happy. And Johnson said, well, he said, 
if you were president, would you give them to him? Well, that's a hard answer. Of course, he knew me pretty well. And the answer is, I probably wouldn't have given him any either. And John, Johnson did. But if we were talking about that, that's one of the things we were chuckling about appointments. And we had an understanding about appointments by then. And he said, you know, I said, how about Oh, Lindley Beckworth, why don't we get him doing something? He was bright, he was back in East Texas. He said, yeah, he'd make a good judge. I got a, we could be appointed a federal judge, special judge. They need one in New York. And he called old Lindley, talked to him about it. Lindley Beckworth, a former congressman from East Texas, was a good guy. Allegedly, he used to take the toilet paper from the office to his house in big bundles. But that's one of those wild stories. I didn't see him do it. But I'd believe it. And so he made Lindley a federal judge and he was very happy as a federal judge for, did a good job for, oh, I guess six, eight, ten years. But Johnson liked to pick up and help people and he would. Well, let's see now. He came to the farm in October of 1963, when he was vice president, he was going to come to the farm for spend the night. And I went to the ranch with him, with Bert and entourage. To, and I called Charlotte to tell her we were going to come in the next morning. And I asked her, I said, Why, the president is perfectly willing, vice president is willing, he could send the plane and pick you all up in Jasper. You and you could come out and spend the night with us. We'd have drinks and dinner. It wouldn't take an hour. But Charlotte uh, said declined that invitation. She'd been working like a dog, getting the house all cleaned up and tidied up and organized. Her 10-year renovation had been done in a week in anticipation of the vice president coming. And she was not cleaned up, didn't have her hair done. Nails weren't done. She was not prepared to leave and go get in the plane and go anywhere. She didn't come. And so we came the next day, and instead of staying one day, Johnson stayed two days, two nights. He slept in the front room of that old house built in 1856. And I hadn't made it fix the new bathroom up there. There was the old bathroom and the tub was a regular tub. But it, an angle, the supports underneath that old bathroom had, had uh, deteriorated and the tub was not level. And uh, in addition to that, there was a lot of iron in the water and the bottom of the tub was brown. Have you ever seen one of those tubs with a brown bottom? Anyhow, that's the way it was. Uh, Johnson and Bird never said one word about that. They didn't mention the, you know, the... They understood about those kind of things. Just, they were not uh, uh, stuffy people. And uh, they didn't say a word about it. That suited them fine. It worked. They didn't say a word. And I told him we'd have a few people there to visit with him. We had about 10 for dinner. My mother, and a few close personal friends. And... Um, we had one dinner downtown at another man's house, E.P. Lindsay, very wealthy Democrat there that did a good job for us and for them. Uh, but uh, the few friends, I had about 2,000 people came by, had three bands, and had him come to the house, Charlotte and Bird and, and, and uh, the president, had him first go down to Siler's house down the road about two miles. We had a, I'd gotten some limousines, got a hold of some limousines and had him pick them up down there and bring them up to the crowd when the crowd was all there. They came rolling in, fine. Got out, all nice. Johnson's there and everybody's out. Gonna go take him up to the stand, make some comments. And it was a white dog about this high, just howling, barking, bothering everybody. 
And my friend Wilton Inman, who was a county agent there, and my good friend still is, kicked that dog out off the ground about this far, and he ran off howling, never saw him again. And the crowd was sitting like this, looking at Johnson and Bird, never said a word. They didn't get excited about it. Now there'd be eight people wanting to call the Humane Society for uh, kicking that dog out of the way like it should have been. But anyhow, Johnson made a good speech. And uh, we visited a minute there. And uh, uh, Johnson admired the pretty girls in the band.
Well, we have corruption in every place. And he said, hell. He said, I'm sure somebody's stealing something right here in Beaumont right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I recall that. And I still can see that picture of that senior citizen that he was handing the first check to. Um, Schlesinger, A.W. Schlesinger, we're still helping them. They were friends of my family from Louisiana, and they run a, uh, a assisted living home here in Beaumont. And my mother was there for a while. But at, back at, at the farm, he stayed at that farm in the same room that uh, I later had uh, Sam Rabin was there. So it's a nice historic room. Sam Houston was in that house too, some years before, before I had it. And uh, Johnson just, he had a good time, I think. I think he enjoyed it. Bird did. Uh, had Lady Bird Johnson, of course, uh, was a sweetheart, always was. Uh, she was a real, help to, to uh, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, not only did he love her as his wife and his mother of his children, but she was a, um, a real uh, strong supporter and a, a good advisor. She was a good judge of, of political matters even. And of course she helped run their business. It was originally her money and they parlayed it and did very well with a little management from Johnson and active management by her, and they did very well. And Johnson liked that business part fine. He just didn't have much time for it. I remember we were talking in New Orleans, um, had a ceremony, and people wondered what we were talking about. Or what we were talking about was I had started a little bank, and Johnson, of course, had a small bank interest or two. And he was telling me that you don't ever loan money to your directors. <laughs> you had nothing but wealthy directors. They didn't borrow any money. <laughs> I thought to myself, doesn't work out that way. My directors borrowed lots of money. And most all of them paid it back. But uh, Johnson was fun. Fun about it. And... Uh, now, they had the convention in 1960 in uh, New Jersey, and it was a big party. We had a good time, had a good time. And uh, Charlotte and I went, well, not, that wasn't in 1960. That must have been in 1968 or 64. No, oh, the convention in 1960, was that in New Jersey? Uh, Los Angeles. Los Angeles? Well, this one was after that. New Jersey oh, was 64. Oh, 64. 64. Yeah. 64 was the one. Yeah. And uh, we had, uh, it was in August, about the time of Charlotte's birthday. We had a big, they had a big party. It lasted into Charlotte's birthday. I told them it was all for her. And, uh, it was a, a good election, a good election. Um, Johnson did well, of course. Now, in the Senate, um, it was a lot of fun for a fairly young member of Congress be over visiting with the majority leader. And in seeing the evenings, he'd maybe have four or five or six senators over having a drink, talking to him. And it was a good time to know them. And I met a lot of important senators on a good basis. And so with uh, Rayburn and then later McCormick, those folks, speakers and so forth, I uh, had a good life as far as political power. 
and there would be no other Texas members of Congress over there, of course, or no other members of Congress, period, over there. And Johnson came down here a lot of times for, when I'd have a fundraiser, Johnson would come. Big fundraiser. Johnson came a couple of times. One time he didn't even tell us he was coming, just, just tried to arrive last minute. We were delighted and it worked out fine. But he would just do that. He, um, he wanted me to, when, when he was vice president one time, we were swimming, had to, we had liked the pool warmer, Johnson and I, so we'd turn it some gun up. Other people liked it cooler. We liked it warmer, so we turned it up. And had those uh, distinguished associates he had from the Philippines serving us drinks and hors d'oeuvres, which was a good way to live in the pool. And uh, Johnson and I were having a good time. Johnson's living well, making a lot of money out of those television stations. And he said, you know, we ought to just quit, Jack. He said, I'll give you some land, build you a big house out there on the lake. We'll go out there and we'll make some money and have some fun. I said, Johnson, I said, Mr. Vice President, you're not going to do that, and I'm not either. But it's a nice offer, and I appreciate it, but we're not going to do that. And you're not either. And we didn't. It was just a thought, you know, the pressure of being vice president with Bobby hating him all the time. <laughs> but, but got to him occasionally. It bothered him. He didn't say that. But uh, it was fun. He was just a nice guy. I don't... Uh, I just think of a, a hundred things he did that were nice. You were with him all during the agonies of the war. Yep. He didn't like the war. He didn't like the war, but you know, uh, it's pretty hard to stop a war when the other side doesn't want to quit. And my theory was that the Vietnamese had nothing to lose. They were using Chinese soldiers. And they just ran them down there by 10,000 a month that a week would come through from China and they'd send them on into the front lines and we'd kill them. Then they'd send some more. And so there wasn't any pressure on the Vietnamese management, government. They just wanted to keep on fighting. They apparently thought they derived some benefit from that. Personally, I thought it was a waste of time. Vietnam was a tough, miserable war. Uh, lost a lot of people um, and didn't accomplish very much. Uh, Johnson didn't start the war and he didn't end it. They didn't want it ended. And uh, I'm sure Jerry Ford was discouraged when it was over with. But uh, they were just tough people to deal with. And uh, guerrilla warfare in somebody else's country is a hard one to win. Just hard to win. When you have people that don't mind dying, individuals, they can create a lot of trouble before they die, each one. And uh, that makes for a lot of problems. Uh, we're faced with that, not quite that, but an, another one of those uh, non-ending troubles in Iraq now. Uh, this is John Johnson's war, thank God. Uh, but we can win the war, but the, uh, the disposition of, of the government and the effect on those people and how it's going to affect the stability of that area of the world will be in controversy for generations. Be a big, big chaos. And we'll be in charge of it. And I, as I told you earlier, visiting with you, I'll bet we get a lot of cooperation from France on that. They'll all want to tell us how to do that. And it won't be easy. It's a, a Saddam has been able to run the country with the gun. And the Shiites and the Kurds, he kills them, often as he can, or with poison gas. And that's one of the problems we have with this guy. He's such a, a wasteful when it comes to using uh, weapons of mass destruction against his own people. Uh, there's nothing to keep him from using it against other people in the world. 
even more sophisticated delivery systems or, or poisons. He's not a good guy. Now, uh, Johnson, when he was president, he was not always, sometimes senators would be giving him trouble, and I, you know, it would be recalcitrant and difficult, not cooperative, and I told him, I said, and he'd be dealing with them, working with them. I told him, well, Mr. President, I tell you, as majority leader, you'd have called him up and pulled his chain good, because I'd heard him do it, and I knew he could and would. He said, well, Jack, you've got to understand, the president has got to use more discretion when he has his hand on the throttle with so much power. You can hurt somebody you don't really want to hurt. And so he was uh, careful about how he used that power with people. He didn't want to hurt anybody. And, uh, and, so, and he didn't. He didn't. Now, when back on being thoughtful, I tell you what, we were visiting at the ranch one time, Charlotte and I, were, we were on a boat, wandering around one of those lakes out there. And we got to talking about families. Charlotte's mama, Inez Wilson in Cameron, Texas, went to Southwestern where Johnson went to school. And he knew that. We had talked about that before we got talking about it. He wanted to know how she was doing. She's doing fine. He said, well, why don't we have her out here for supper tonight? Well, Charlotte called her and made arrangements that they could be, and they sent the plane to pick them up in Cameron or Hearn, Texas, wherever they landed the plane, brought them to the ranch, had dinner, had a wonderful time. Now, there are not many people that are that thoughtful that we'll send a plane to get your mother-in-law or your mother and her, new, her husband and fly them out here and have dinner with them, wine and dine them and treat them right. And just not many people that would do that, but Johnson did. <laughs> he won, and they spent the night at the ranch. They loved it. They talked about it till they died. Um, one I don't read that I just say that you can't say that Johnson was not a major force in the country and you've got a lot of people going to give you all the details of his legislative accomplishments and all that business and uh, while I participated in it and voted for 99% of it, I don't know what I voted against, not much. Uh, but I just did not want to uh, spend my time analyzing what the historians have already got written down in the record. And they didn't know him anyhow. And they're not going to talk about these things. They didn't know him from Adams or Fox. They know about the legislation and all this and when he was there and all that. It has nothing to do with the real makeup of the man. And I liked him, thought he was a good man, uh, a wonderful man who did much for this country, who wanted to do things for this country, and who did them. I think history should show that you passed the legislation that saved the presidential libraries. Well, that might be so. Yep. The, the uh, National Archives Independence Act. Yep. You got them out from under the General Services Administration, which wanted to destroy the libraries. I understand. I remember, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, you would be interested in that. Yeah, and the library. Would be <laughs> sure, they would. That, that, that ought to be part of the record of the library. Yes, it should be. Well, that's true. Well, you all have done a good job down there. And uh, I think you want to say that it's been done even better because Lady Bird Johnson has continued to nurture it, to encourage it in every way, because she's smart and she's uh, uh, got a good perception of what 
history ought to be and what the future ought to be. She wanted to preserve it all, and she has been a strong and stalwart supporter of the program and the project. She certainly has. And she yeah, still boy. is. Yeah, she still is. All right, Robert. It's good to see you again. Oh, great. It's wonderful. Glad your children are well. Thank you. Jim found his way down here. Yes. Quit recording.